so this morning, let's go ahead and transition into the message. Last week, I was talking about relationships. And, you know, one good relationship can really bless you. One bad relationship can really do some damage. And this morning, I kind of want to go into uh, what it means to be single and what it means to pursue, you know, a, a partner and then also marriage. I want to talk about marriage. So let's go ahead and start in Genesis 2 and verse 18. Let me pray real quick. Father, I pray you bless this word. I pray, God, people's ears are open to receive from your spirit and not from men or man. That, God, it's not my flesh, but by your spirit. And what is of flesh or what is carnal, God, it would die. It would fall to the ground. But what is by your spirit and what is of your word will not return void. It will go forward. It will accomplish what you send it forth to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Then man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So I had this thought when I was preparing this message because there's a story I want to share with you. Uh, Amy and I, when we were in, uh, I want just to keep this thing anonymous, but we were at one of our places when we were ministering. And there was a lady there who was such a servant, so awesome, such a sweet lady. But she had, I'm telling you, probably 350 cats living in her house. This is no joke. How many know your cat and your dog doesn't substitute a human being? No matter what weirdos out there want to try to make their dogs and their cats, right? I was sitting sitting there, and all of a sudden I see the news, and this lady comes on the news. Didn't know anything about it until I saw the news, and it's like, so-and-so, this many cats, and, and her house had to be condemned because she was in love with cats more than she was people. And she didn't have anybody coming in her house going, what the heck is going on here? You, you have three, I'm telling you, I'm, I, I probably am underestimating how many cats. She had hundreds of cats living in her house. So we see that God says there wasn't a helper found fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh and the rib that the Lord God had taken from that man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man. Right? You heard that one before? Woe man. Because when Adam saw the woman, he was like, woo. Woo. He he got excited (laughs) because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There's something about intimacy, and I really believe it's only found, well, you have your relationship with God where you can be totally naked, right, and unashamed because he loves us that much. But then with people, it's, it's a little harder to kind of let your hair down and be, be transparent and be open because people like to throw things at you. People like to talk about you. People like to hurt you, right? Especially people who are hurting. Uh, the old saying, hurt people hurt people. And when people are hurting, they, they, they have a tendency to hurt others. And in a marriage relationship, one of the most beautiful things is that you can be transparent and totally naked and unashamed with another person, right? Not with many per- people, not with everyone, but with one person. I believe that in this as well, we see the, the gender confusion that's in our world today addressed. There is a man and a woman. God created a man and a woman. There wasn't them, they, her, she, whatever, right? Right? 
The man was different, distinct from the woman. The woman didn't come out going, man, I want to be you. Right? The woman didn't, or the man didn't say, God, what are you doing? I wish I, I was like her. And we see this, and, and I really believe the devil, he wants to attack this marriage. He wants to attack the identity because it's, it's about maiming and hurting God. It's about coming against his standard, who he is, what he has created, what his standard is for our life. And he wants to affect marriage. He wants to break it down and destroy it. Because when there's two really united people walking in his will and his purpose, there's power. And the Bible even talks about that. A man and a woman, a wife, when they pray together, there's power in agreement. There's power for your, for your relationships. So we see this in our, in our society, this search for companionship. When I was single, man, I wanted to get married, especially when you get around, you know, I don't know. <laughs> well, when you get saved, right, you become a Christian, then you're like, I got to get married because I got I to gotta be able to have sex and not feel like I'm doing something wrong here, right? I'm just being real, guys. Come on. People who don't have God in their life, they're like, well, whoever and whenever, and as long as it feels good, let's do it. But people with God, right, there's a standard. There's something that he calls us to. And we have to be faithful in that. And we have to say, God, I want the one that you have for me. And God, give me the one that you. It's a desire of, God, connect me with the person that you have for my life. And what does that look like? What does it look like when you're single and you're seeking a mate? What is God's standard? What, what does he have for you? And what, how does your gifting and who you are connect with the other person? It's not just about sex and attraction. How many of y'all know that's a, that's a formula for failure? There's so many people that see, ooh, baby, right? You know, get all excited, see a good-looking girl or a girl be like, oh, my God, he's so cute. And then they cook up and then year and a half, and when the fire comes, the next thing you know, they're, right? I had a pastor say, the good thing turns into swamp thing, right? <laughs> the very person you say, I love, and oh, I can't wait to marry you. I can't stand this person. Right? And then, I want a divorce. I hate you. Blah, they say all kind of bitter stuff. This happens all the time. And really, because I believe people pursue this thing that's, it's, it, actually Paul talks about it being a mystery, but it's, they pursue this thing without the Holy Spirit, without God, because he's the one that designed it. So if you want to do it with success and have a, a marriage that lasts forever, then you need principles, you need wisdom, you need understanding, and you need to know how to choose God's way and not just follow your emotions, because your emotions will flip on you. Your emotions will be like, I love and I'll be with you forever. And then a little while later, I hate you and I'm going to kill you. Because that's the human condition, the brokenness. As you're pursuing the person you want to marry, look at the call of God. Know the call of God on your life before you connect with the person that you're supposed to run with. Know what God has called you to. Know his purpose. Know your giftings. Know what, what he's asking of you in your life because God wants to bring somebody who is a help me, right? That, that we're help, we help one another, but the woman is specifically called in the Bible one to come alongside and help. She's there not to be subservient and a slave. Can I get an amen, women, right? I know we're in the South and we still might have to break some, some mindset here because I've, I've watched some of those Maury Povich shows of some of those Southern guys. And the woman can't even look up, and he's, like, telling her what to do. And she's like, yes, sir. I mean, that's not God's heart. That's demonic. That's controlling. That's wicked. That's evil. She has a place at your side as your queen. She holds the same authority and same position. And how many of you know all us wise men, 
you know, are really wise women, they let, they let the man think they're in control, right? <laughs> they, they let us think that we're in control because it, it helps us be more healthy and productive in our life. If you get a woman who's, I mean, trust me, there's, there's the opposite too of that, right? You have the woman who's the one who wears the pants and she's bossing the guy around and you look and the guy just looks, def- he's walking around and he's just like busted. He's like, oh my God, what did I do? Have we ever seen those kind of relationships? The woman runs the man. That's not God's way either. There's a balance. And it comes with relationship and intimacy. God should play a huge role in who we choose to marry. And this is where I want to talk about. Is it destiny? Right? People say, well, God's, I want the one that God has for me. God, who do you have for me? I know people who are are still in that place at 50 years old. God, who do you have for me? And there's no shame. There's no guilt. But it's maybe you just need to find somebody and make a choice to love and serve that person and not look for Prince Charming or some fantasy or some version of some movie you saw, but that you really understand the purpose of what marriage is, is connected in him and his purpose for your life and the calling that's on your life. Because if you can yoke up with that together, then you have something to fight for and to stand with. It's not just about the, because let me tell you, life will go like this. There's roller coaster ride, right? Ups and downs. And you want somebody who's faithful And who's not just in it for your good looks, because your good looks can go out the window, right? They're not in it for your money, because you can lose all your money. But they're in it for you, and how they love you, and what they see, and how they believe in you. And that's both ways. It's not just one way. It's not just one person saying, well, I married you, so you would do everything I wanted you to do, and I just don't see that happening, so I'm out. No, it's... How can I serve you? How can I love you? You know, people say, you know, till death do us part. But really, marriage is a dying process from the very beginning. Is it not? All of us married people, if we're married for a while, it's like you've got to realize you're coming to a relationship not to get everything you want, everything you think you should have and need, but you're there to die to yourself. And that brings a healthy foundation for God to build on. Let's go to uh, Genesis 24 in verse 1. It says, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. So he's concerned about who his son is going to marry. He doesn't want him to marry somebody from another tribe of godless people because he understands God's command and teaching. Because there were, even in the Bible, in Solomon, right? Solomon was a great example of this. He was the wisest man, but he was also the dumbest man because of how he handled his relationship with women. He had, what was it, thousands of concubines and and all this stuff, and what happens is these women from other, that don't love the Lord, that don't love God, begin to move his heart away from God. And this isn't just for women, this is for men as well, right? That men can have that effect. How many of y'all know the, the, the bad guy syndrome? The girl who's pretty, the girl who's got everything, her life ahead of her, and then for some reason she just wants to hang out with a guy who's going to end up in prison in a couple, couple years because, Right? So there's a dynamic there of making the right decision and looking to the Lord to confirm what he's doing. It doesn't mean he keeps us from everything, right? Like everything's not perfect in our life. We understand that marriage brings sometimes, even Paul said, I wish you were like I because he was single, but he, he said because marriage has its struggles or its worries and it brings challenge we think when we're single, marriage will come and bring a solution because now we can, as Christians, now we can have sex all, all we want. And we're free to do it. We don't have to feel guilt and shame. But the dynamic of even that will, will increase 
the level of intensity and conflict in your marriage. Because now you're entering into this place that is holy and pure before the Lord of having really when you get married and you're both virgins, there's there's this thing that happens where it's literally a covenant being made. A, a blood covenant that, that is made between you and that person forever. And the problem is, is when we have relationship after relationship and break up and break up and break up, we, we really just train ourselves to leave the person that, that we marry because we're, we're getting used to when things get hard, bailing. Why is there so much divorce? And people say, oh, I finally found the one I met. And they get divorced. It's funny, too, because in the movies you have, you know, always these stories of, like, the destiny or whatever, and it's all, like, fun, and, you know, sometimes you cry because it's like, oh, it's so sweet. But then the actor or the actress has been married five times in their own life because it's just fantasy. It's just, it's for entertainment. It's not reality. So we see the servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you'll be free from this oath. So we see this idea of choice. Another thing in Christianity is these guys who think God told them this is going to be your wife. I had an experience in California where when I first got saved, and I'll just kind of be transparent here, but when I got saved, I was, I was a virgin still. I was 21 years old, and there had been, you know, relationships in my life and fooling around and stuff, but I just never went to that place. For some reason, I always had this desire to want to be with this one person. I think my parents instilled that in me, but I always had this desire to want to be faithful. Like, I used to have these, <laughs> this is, this is going to be funny, but remember the Wizard of Oz, right? <laughs> remember Dorothy? When I was little, I'd be like, one day I want to have a Dorothy that I marry. Because maybe it was just that Over the Rainbow song, just as a little boy, just wow. And then I found this beautiful woman who can sing. She hasn't sung Over the Rainbow yet to me, though. But this dynamic of choice, it's a choice who you love. And you have to make a good choice. It doesn't mean that God doesn't love everyone or God can't help people. It's just that when you decide to connect your life with somebody forever, until you die, till death do us part, you need to really, really pray and consider God. God, I want what you have for my life. Because what he has for you is the best. So to go back to the story in California, there was this girl. She was, she was a little older than me. She was beautiful. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. Uh, and I'm kidding you. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding you. I was walking on the street, and I was just, you know, I was in California, and I think it was Studio City. I was walking, and all of a sudden, I saw her name on the, on the concrete. And this is how you can get when you're a Christian. Sometimes you can become goofy, right? Because you're trying to hear God. You're, 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 you're learning. And I go, oh, my gosh, that's the Lord speaking to me. She's supposed to be my wife. So finally, I, I got up enough courage to go and kind of tell her and, and, and let her know, and she was totally like, oh, my gosh, I think she was flattered. But <laughs> come to find out, she was having a relationship with one of the guys in the church and was sleeping with him. And I had left to go to Texas to go pursue school and to, be, to go to Bible school, and I found out through the grapevine, oh, she's pregnant, and she's having twins with this other guy who was an actor. He was like a player, you know, had that kind of player mentality. And she ends up not getting married or whatever, but having, having these two kids. And that experience for me really woke me up to see, oh, wow, 
God protected me. Because when I, when I, when I, it didn't work out the way I thought it, it was really painful and it hurt. It was like rejection. But sometimes God will reject the thing that you're wanting in your life because it's not what he has for you. And there's a saying that says God's rejection is really his protection. You know, rejection can be used to really destroy people and really come in and just wound them and break them down. But when you have an understanding to trust God for what he has for you, you can not let it go so deep and hurt so much. And my experience was I just had to go through some healing, but I also had to trust the Lord and walk it out. And I was in that situation. I know I felt like God probably did lead me in that path to just kind of correct me. But in that experience, it was like he turned that, that, that desire to want to be with somebody off for a season until I met my wife probably five or six later, or five or six years later. I met her and it was like I prayed and I fasted. I, I, I did a 30 day fast because I wanted to know that this was the one that God had for me. And when I pursued her, I wanted God with me to confirm what he was doing in my life. So to say all that, it is a choice. And when God helps you make the right choice, he'll confirm it in your life and you can avoid some of the heartache and the pain. Doesn't mean you're going to avoid it all, but it will help you. Amen? So that, that uh, verse 8, willingness if she's not willing we need to be willing if God is doing something uh, before I met Amy there was a there was a girl who really liked me in school and I, I just wasn't feeling it I didn't really like her I was kind of like I liked her as a friend she was awesome she was an amazing person I could talk to her she was sweet but she ended up really liking me in, in a different way and I remember feeling like the Lord said I want you to be open to this relationship and so we began to build a relationship, and we got to a certain point, and I just felt in my spirit, I had, I had ministered to her, I spoke into her life, but then I felt kind of this, okay, end it now. Because God was wanting me in a, in a, the best way that I knew how to do it was to break it off, right? To, to let her down gently and, and to do it in a way that was probably, I, I feel like, maybe the right way to do it, instead of playing or playing a game or you know, there's people that love to play games in relationships, drag people on even though they don't really like them. And there's always the guy, right, the friend zone. <laughs> You're in the friend zone, dude. But in the, in the meanwhile, they're, they're just in love with the girl and she's just playing them. That's horrible. So we want to be led in our pursuit of who we marry. Once you choose, they become the one. When you choose that person and you decide to get married, they become the one. They're the one. Oh, I'm waiting for the one. There's got to be the one out there. And when you make that choice, you're committing, and now they're the one. Amen? You commit to covenant with and swear to love before God and man. It's not just something you do half-heartedly. It's something you put all your, your heart into, something that you do before God and and before men to say, this is the person I'm going to commit to, not just as a religious duty, but as a way of, of saying, hey, this is my wife, and y'all keep me accountable because this is the one I'm committed to. And I'm stating it before the Lord, but I'm also stating it before everyone else. At my wedding, this is the one I'm going to commit to the, all the days of my life, and I'm going to be faithful. Amen? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is, is it good for a man not to touch a woman? Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. You see that balance there? It doesn't just say the husband has authority over his wife. and No, it says the, and the woman has over her husband. So there's, there's a dynamic there of surrender and yielding to one another to serve one another's needs. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time 
that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So he's talking about being intimate. And he's saying, don't, don't deprive one another. You know, the, one of the greatest tools the enemy uses in marriage is that issue. Because the men are usually like, let's go for it. And the women sometimes are a little bit, you know, they're, they're different. They're not like men. Men are like, anytime, all time, whenever you're ready, let's go. Right? I don't know, maybe I'm talking to some people that... <laughs> Come on, I'm just being real, guys. Come on. And the women sometimes are like, really? Right now? Uh. And they just don't, they, the, the connection isn't the same. So there's this work and this, this, this surrender and this love of serving and, and understanding, okay, it's not always just about what I want, but it's about blessing and serving the other person. I don't belong to me anymore. It's not my body. I don't get to just do it, but I can... Love and still, sometimes that sacrificial love is, is the thing that builds and, and God comes and gets involved in building the relationship. You can try it on your own strength. You can build a marriage just trying to do it all right. But when you get God involved, let me tell you, there's a different experience and a different level of intimacy with your spouse. It's a beautiful thing. God created marriage. He created sex. He created it all to glorify him because it's a part of who he is. God loves to get to, for us to experience pleasure in his context, under his rule and authority, because he created it. So you can try to go out and do it the world's way and do it sin's way, and let me tell you, it will leave you empty. It will leave you way down, right, depressed, oppressed, feeling guilty and shame. Or you can do it God's way and you can be free and you can go higher and higher in the things of God and within your relationships. <laughs> Is this a little intense here this morning? <laughs> I just feel like people are like, oh my God. But I just, you know, I'm being real this morning. We shouldn't deprive one another unless we're going to pray and fast. There's a, there's a dynamic of coming together as a husband and wife and seeking the Lord together. And pursuing his purpose and his plan for your life. That you would know how to get together and get in agreement and pray and fast and push away the world. Push away the noise. Push away everybody else's thoughts and opinions. And just get before God and his word and you guys come together. And you abstain from that act while you're pursuing him. Because there's a benefit to doing it God's way. And he will come in and he will... Sometimes it's just a matter of him putting something in her heart, putting something in my heart, and it's the same thing. And if there is a disagreement, then that causes us to slow down, to say, okay, hold on a second. There's not unity here. We need to fight for this place of unity because we don't want to give place to the devil. In fact, the Bible says, don't let um, the sun go down on your wrath because it gives place to the enemy, meaning if you're angry and you're fighting and you're going through some kind of intense moment in your marriage, you don't go to bed and sleep on it you handle it you nip it in the bud you get to the you get down to it and you say listen we might not agree but let's for the sake of God's word and what he asks us to do shelf it together in unity we'll put it on the shelf we'll, we'll address it later but don't cold shoulder don't get all mad go in the other room and pout and get all and, and try to play a game with your spouse that, that just causes, it allows the devil to get in there. It'll, it'll cause the heart to become hard. And you won't be able to have that connection. And it'll allow for you to grow apart and become distant in your relationship. But I say to the unmarried and the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am, and that's single, this is Paul talking, but if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Now, I wouldn't say that's Paul saying, hey, if you need to have sex, just go find somebody quick and get married. Let's go to Vegas, right? Let's get it done. Woo! No, he's saying, then make, make it your aim before the Lord to say, God, lead my life. Lead my life and instruct me and show me who you want me to be with. And God will provide. He's, he's good. He'll show you. But you have to be 
willing and ready. And, and you know, when you choose, that becomes the one. You know, sexuality is huge in our culture right now. We know that sex sells, right? It's all over the place, anywhere you go. It's the perversion of sexuality that sells. It's God created sexuality, and in its context, it's pure, it's holy. But because of the world and the, and the enemy, he's come in and he's perverted it. And we see it in the last five years. It's the, the intensity on that thing has just exploded. Right now you got, uh, <laughs> there is an agenda behind the LGBTQ, ABCDFG, okay? There's an agenda. It's a demonic agenda. And yeah, I'm saying that, and this goes out and people hear it. It's an agenda, just like God has an agenda to see people saved, and there are people that feel called to go out and evangelize. You have people that will have the same intensity over this issue, and they'll go out and they'll evangelize that, that demonic creed. They have, they have even groups that purposely will set up in certain towns or areas, and they'll, go, they'll have a plan to try to go and attack, and they'll go after the kids. They go after the children. Because they know the precept of teaching your kids the things of God, right? That's what we're supposed to do because they're at a, 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 a very susceptible age. And you can put in them the things of God and the plan of God and the ways of God. That's why we need to protect our kids and we need to fight for what's going on in our schools. Because there's an agenda to come in and try to capture your kids. And the statistics now... Of, I mean, I, I went to elementary school. I didn't have any of this garbage or somebody, you know, coming in and acting all, all of a sudden having an identity struggle at eight years old or ten years old. Hallelujah. Praise him. <laughs> right? I mean, it's crazy. And the statistics are rising. Why? Because that demonic creed is going out and it's being pumped and these kids, you know, the devil's a deceiver. He comes in to deceive and capture your mind. And so when we're just sitting back and we're just like, well, whatever, I don't know what to do. And you're trying to, like, play the middle road and play a game. Don't, don't, don't be surprised when Jimmy or Susie comes home and next thing you know they're going, well, I don't know. I just, you know, I feel like I'm a boy or I feel like I'm a girl. And they're not. It's unreal. And I don't understand all the theories and all the scientific stuff, but I don't have to. I have God's word, and I'll believe his word over some perverted scientist or perverted whatever who wants to come in and play, play some kind of twisted game because they're sick. You know, God didn't create us to be obsessed with our sexuality. People literally, their lives, it's... Like, really? Your whole life is built on sexuality? That's, it. That's all that you can focus on? There's not, not other things that you can put your time and your passion in? It's all about sex and pleasure, and, and that's the thing that means the most to you? To where you'll fight and you'll be, you know, you'll get so riled up over stuff that's like, it's, you know, when you get down underneath the surface of it all, it's very demonic. True sexuality, the way God designed it, was to deepen intimacy and is the very gift God has given us to procreate. Think about that responsibility. If we in our schools would teach sexual responsibility instead of sexual education. Well, let's just tell them how it all works and then y'all go figure it out. No, let's teach them that there's a responsibility to you having sex. Right? What if you taught go into neighborhoods and you shifted all the stuff they're being taught and it was more about hey guess what you know when you have sex what happens you get kids wow isn't that amazing it seems like everybody walks around just numbed down to it all oh man so i'm gonna go out and i'm gonna party i'm gonna go get laid right right i'm gonna go out and i'm gonna do my thing and then what you're pregnant oh no i didn't know that happened Oh, crap, what am I going to do? And then abortion, all this murdering that's going on through this demonic thing. Because people don't want to be responsible for their actions. 
hey, this is, there's mercy, there's grace. People have messed up, people have failed. This isn't a here to, to condemn you. This is for you to understand there's a better way. And you can choose that way. You can actually decide in your heart, God, I want your way. Your flesh will lead you down roads and it'll, and it'll put you in a place of a, of a pit and a trap. But if you follow the Lord, he'll bless you. I mean, no, we don't need moms with so many kids, they can't even, they can't even take care of them. They can't be the nurturing, loving mother that they're called to be. They, they're struggling. They, a lot of these you know, situations where they're abusing the kids, they can't, they're so impatient, they can't, do, they can't handle it. There's no one there to help them. The dad's off, whatever. He's, whether he's working full time or some situations, he ain't doing nothing. And the mom's left there, and then the government steps in. The next thing you know, the government becomes the bottle that they're, you know, nursing on, yeah. Instead of God, instead of his word, instead of his church and his community that's there to help. Not just give handouts, but to really meet the need in people's lives of teaching them and giving them understanding of what it means. What is sexuality, and how can you be responsible with this thing that God's given you? To create life. Think about it. My kids, they weren't here, and now they're here. But they're so incredible. They're so amazing. I love them so much. I've never felt such a love in all my life. I love my wife, and I, I love her very much. But let me tell you, I've, that love was different, right, than when I had my kids. Oh, my gosh, there's just a different love there. I can't explain it. And that doesn't mean I don't love you, babe. I do love you. <laughs> But that, that, there's just this feeling. I just think about my kids, and I just want to weep, and I want to cry because I just, and sometimes I want to do it because I think about the world they're growing up in. And I'm like, oh, my God, please protect them. Keep them. Put your arms around them. Send your angels. Because of what they're growing up and stepping into in our society. Instead of sexual education in schools, it should be sexual responsibility. Amen. The simplicity is a choice, a decision, not a fairy tale. Um, let's go to Proverbs eighteen twenty two. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. So how are you going to get married if you don't actually open yourself up to go seek and desire and, and say, hey, God, show me the one. Show me the one that you have for me. Right, obviously, like I was saying, they have to agree with you, <laughs> but there's this thing of God. I want to know the one you have for me, and then when you do, you, it's a choice you make. It's a choice. They don't. They don't just. Well, that's the one, and you get to like force them to marry you. Good luck with that. If that's the way you think, it's a choice. Uh, love is a choice. We want God's choice. We learn about God's love when we choose God's ways. Proverbs 3, 6 says, in all your ways, acknowledge him, recognize and acknowledge him. He will direct and make straight your path. That's involving relationships. That's involving not just the marriage relationship, but all your relationships. Seek him. Ask him, God, should I get close? God, sh what should I do here? God, how, how should I handle this relationship? Because not everybody that looks good and smells good is good. Right? Right? I mean, y'all been blindsided sometimes by some relationships. People say, I love you. I'm here for you. We like you. We want you. And then just give them an opportunity, and they'll turn on you real quick. They did it to Jesus. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. And then crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. That's people. That's how they are. They're fickle. But when you find one's that you can connect with on a heart level that are loyal and that are true friends, you invest, you spend time, you connect with, and you make a point to build a relationship. It's not half half-hearted thing. Well, I'm just gonna be friends with everybody. Well, get ready for a knife in the back. It happens. <laughs> I mean, most, like I said, most people's struggles and, and things they've gone through in their life has been because people have hurt them and yeah it's the devil and the devil's working through people but people are the ones right I mean you go outside and stub your toe 
ah, you're going to blame the, the street, right? No, you're going to, oh, I, I wasn't looking, I, I tripped, right? But if you go outside and purposely kick the ground to hurt your foot, it's a different thing. So there's, there's a dynamic of choosing and making sure that when you connect with people, you're making the right decisions. I hope that <laughs> analogy worked. <laughs> All right. Ephesians, or, or wait, yeah, I already did Proverbs 3. Ephesians 5, and we will come to a close here. My desire is to keep the service about an hour and a half, so I'm hoping you guys can hang in there with me. I know we're used to uh, shorter services, but I like God, and I like hanging out with him. I like preaching. If, if, my, if my preaching gets too boring for you, I'm sorry. Um. <laughs> But, but uh, you, you know, obviously you're free. You don't have to stay here and listen. You can say, no, oh, that hour's gone and my time's up. Okay, we love you. But if you want to stay here with us, we, we appreciate it. Ephesians 5.22 says this. Wives, be subject, be submissive, and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, himself the Savior of his body. As the, as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So we see this relationship of a husband speaking in and in, in speaking the word of God over his wife, not in a way that's like, well, you see this here, you're going to get in trouble if you don't do what I say, you know, like in a, in a judgmental way. But it's in a way that you're shaping and you're forming and you're speaking love and encouragement, you know. And, and sometimes there is a, a, a dynamic of being stern or being, hey, this is, uh, this is my conviction. And then it's the wife's responsibility to surrender and submit herself to her husband. It's not a lording over. It's a I love you and I'll surrender as unto the Lord. Because sometimes you don't feel it. You're not going to feel in a marriage. I've been married for a while now. And there's times where we both, I don't care what you think, you know. I'm going to do what I want to do. And that usually kicks me in the butt, you know, down the road. <laughs> but when we're w willing and able to surrender and submit to one another, it's like inviting the Lord into that place. So scripture says three, four, cold, uh, three, four, Fold cord is not easily broken. I think it's, yeah, Ecclesiastes 4.12. And that scripture is talking about a threefold cord. Well, it's you, God, and your wife and your spouse. And when you are united together, there's not this ability to break it, to destroy it. But when it's just you and your husband without God, it's easier to break that. It's easier for the enemy to come in because there's no supernatural protection and word of God there to, to hold you up and be a foundation for your marriage. Even so, husbands love their wives being a sense. It says, even so, husbands should love their wives as being in a sense their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and carefully protects and cherishes it. And Christ does the church. As Christ does the church. So we're to, you know, it's easy to take care of yourself and make sure you're taken care of. But that's not when we get married, we're supposed to take care, um, take care of, nourish our wives. Meaning, I, it's not just about my needs anymore. It's about her needs. It's about what does she need. And a lot of men think, well, it's just about the wife. Fulfill my needs. I've been out all day. I'm working. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Where's my dinner? What, this isn't clean? Why isn't this clean? I mean, this is the old mindset, right? There's dirty dishes in the sink. And now, nowadays, my wife's telling me there's dirty dishes. I'm in trouble. The dishwasher's right here. It's empty. Put it in the dishwasher. Okay. Jeez. So there's a dynamic of... of my desire now should be to make sure she's taken care of, just like I would take care of myself. And there's been times in our relationship where I've had to learn the hard way with that one. 
I'm t- oh, 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 it's just, you're just going to take it. You're just going to eat? What a <laughs> I'm telling on myself. But it's true. You know, you have to learn and grow with God and grow in marriage. Gosh, this feels kind of intense in this room. Is everybody good? Everybody okay? <laughs> Amen. Uh, because we are members, parts of his body, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. And there's, there, I'm just going to touch just a little bit on this. But when a man leaves his father and mother, that means mother and father, you got to let them leave, right? Let them leave and cleave. Hey, I did my job. How many of y'all, there's always the mother-in-law. There's always that mother-in-law just wants to keep, especially with some reason with the boys. They seem to be more like it's their, her son, and they become almost like weird. That's why there's the old, like, you know, my mother-in-law, the jokes about mother-in-laws. But let your daughter, let your son be, be their own person. They're now married. They're now, they're now, it's between them and God. It means you, doesn't mean you can't have something to say or advice. But when they come running to you, teach them to run to the Lord. Teach them, go, you go, you have a relationship. He's going to fix your marriage. I'm not going to fix your marriage. Okay? I can give you advice. I can speak into it. But I'm not here to be God for you and your husband. Or try to control or now become this you know, a lot of times it's siding with the, with the son or the, whatever the, the kid is, and they'll side with one, and then they'll be like this, we're going to come after you now and try to control and make you do what we want you to do, family type of stuff. That's evil. God's not involved in that. He wants us to have freedom and liberty. And when we're involved in our kids' lives like that, it's controlling. It's weird. Take your claws off. Let them be released. Let them be separated and to cling to their wife or their husband. uh, This mystery is very great. So here's Paul saying, he's admitting this is a mystery. It's very great. But I speak concerning the relation of Christ and the church. However, let each man of you without exception love his wife as being in a sense his very own self. And let the wife see that she respects and reverences her husband that she notices him, regards him, honors him, prefers him, venerates and esteems him, and that she defers to him, praises him, and loves him, and admires him exceedingly. The word reverence, honor, respect, felt shown, profound, adoring, awed, an, an awe for. You know, men love respect. Something about men who love to be, to feel like they're doing a good job, and that their wife just goes, honey, I'm so proud of you. You're such a good man. The last thing you want is some contentious, angry, right? You're not this. You didn't do this. You're not good enough. Blah, 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 blah. And the man's over there like, I'm just defeated and I'm no good and I'm, right? That's that number one voice in your life. And if you allow yourself to get bitter and angry in that relationship, you'll become the devil to your spouse instead of becoming the Holy Spirit and allowing God to move through your life to champion and to encourage and to help, and there's times where you instruct, but it's coming from this place of, I want you to succeed, not make you who I want you to be for my selfish, right? And when you get in that disgruntled place in relationship, it will break down and destroy marriage. It never builds it up. So we have to respect. Women respect. Men love, cherish. Cherish, to hold dear feel or show affection for, to keep or cultivate with care and affection, to entertain or harbor in the mind deeply, resolutely. I love my wife. I think about her. I can just, I just think about waiting for her to get home, right? And just, I can think about my wife in a way that's just incredible, right? And I can have that heart here, but I, I need to let her know it. I need to speak it. I need to show it to her so that she can Feed off of that. That's, that's, that's a benefit of being married. It's not so that y'all could be grumpy and mad and just, oh, we're just gonna, we've been married 40 years, but we hate each other. We're just being faithful to the Lord, but I can't stand him. I mean, that's no kind of marriage that you want. You want, you want after 40 years of marriage to just, oh, baby, ooh, sugar. Right? And that's a beautiful thing you cultivate. It doesn't just... You might feel it in the beginning. There's always the honeymoon, you know, phase in marriage. But then as you 
walk out, things happen, and sometimes you're not in the spirit. Sometimes you maybe drift away from your discipline, and then you can find yourself in this funky place. And the next thing you know, all that love and feeling, I lost that love and feeling, now it's gone, gone, right? You have to cultivate and contend to keep that in your life and in your marriage. That's the part of work. It takes work. It doesn't just, oh, I'm just waiting for that feeling again to fall out of the sky for me. It's, it's work. However, let each man, uh, wait, I already read that part, sorry. So let's go ahead and uh, let me take a minute here and collect my thoughts. True love speaks of commitment. Time always reveals true commitment and true love. When we give time to something, especially in, in those who are seeking to be married, if it's happening fast and there's a rush to do it, I would pull back and let God have some space. Let him, let him reveal because time is the greatest enemy to deception. If you want to know where the devil's working, use time against him. Use, be patient, especially in big decisions. True, true love speaks of commitment, and God's fire will expose motives and true intentions. In your marriage, when you have the fire of God and the Holy Spirit there, it's not always just goosebumps, and sometimes God's allowing there to be this tension because he's getting out some of the stuff that's on the inside that's impure. Some of the, the, the belief systems and the things that you have developed maybe from your childhood or your example from your mom and your dad, and maybe there was a dysfunction there. And sometimes the tension comes to expose those things in your life. And you have to be in it with God to realize, okay, this is a part of it. So when you get all funky and you know, man, I really don't feel close to God right now. I feel angry. I feel abused. I feel like I've been used. I feel like I've been walked on. Whatever it is, the negative emotions that come in marriage. You have to let God into that place to go, hey, you know some of that way you're feeling? That's because you need me. You need to be healed. You need to change the way you think on this one area. You're so stuck in your head that you think this is the way it should be, and it's causing tension and contention in your marriage instead of allowing me to come and shift your focus so that I can come in and breathe on that place. Amen? I want to just take a moment. I want to pray for marriages. If you'll just bow your head and close your eyes with me, please. And if you're married, just, just grab the hand of your spouse. And Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would bring healing. Lord, that your presence would just manifest upon them, Lord. If there's any anger, if there's, any, if there's anyone in here that's on the verge of divorce, or if there's anyone in here that's having contention in their marriage, God, I pray that you would come and breathe. Breathe your breath of life over them. God, I pray that all the pain and all the resentment, all the past, God, would melt away. It's a new day. God gives us a fresh start. If you've had a bad marriage, it doesn't matter what the past is. It matters what your decisions are now and looking to the future and inviting him into that place. God, I pray that you would come and you would just rest. Even as they go home, God, that your presence would go with them. And that, God, they would just yield and surrender all their frustrations and anger to you. And let you come in and heal. I speak healing in Jesus' name. Healing over marriages and relationships. Not only marriage, but, but father and son and daughter and mother. I pray healing. God, I pray that you would heal wounds. That you would give us the ability to take on and take responsibility for some of the stuff we've done. And God, I pray for forgiveness. Forgiveness right now. Most powerful thing, God, forgiveness over our life. And I pray even for those, God, that who've, who've maybe been divorced or who, have, who, are, who are seeking maybe another, after a divorce, God, I pray, God, that, you, that they would understand that, Lord, you're good and you forgive. You're not holding over them their prior marriage. They don't have to live in that place. They don't have to carry it around with them into their future, but God, that they can be freed up in the reset button hit so that they can walk and they get another chance because you're a God 
of another chance. You're a God of a million chances. You're so good. Your grace is sufficient. You're faithful. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We just rest on you today. Hallelujah. In all ages and all races. This must be what heaven This must be This must be